The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13064 in the name of Jean Urquhart on media, society and democracy. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Before I call Jean Urquhart, I would remind members that they should not make any references to ongoing live cases during their contributions. Ms. Urquhart, seven minutes if you are ready, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We live in a society which relies on the quick flow of information. And we live in a time when analysis and opinion of the latest developments are consumed by an awakening general public. That awakening is down in large part to the referendum debate, through which there was widespread discussion, not just of the constitutional question, but of wider social issues, and indeed the media coverage of this historic event. There is a changing relationship between the people of Scotland and power. The democratic revival we are experiencing is marked by the surge in interest in politics. That means where we get our news and indeed in whose interest, interests the media is run is of renewed importance and must be under intensified scrutiny. Presiding officer, on the 29th of April, the Scottish Government, uh, rightly so, had a debate on TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And in my short experience in this place, I have not seen the, uh, packed, the, the public gallery packed as it was. And I think I would be right in saying that the issue was raised through social media that brought the public's attention to an item of real interest and real concern. And if social media can do that, then let's have more of that. Presiding officer, we have to discuss ways in which we can support journalism in Scotland. Local newspapers provide an often invaluable service, and certainly in the Highlands and Islands, we have a healthy distribution of local press. And the new wave of citizen-led coverage and comment is an important development that must be registered. And I'm pleased to note, and I didn't know this until recently, that this is actually Local Newspaper Week. We need to think in an interconnected way about investment into journalism and print media while recognising the surge in social and new media. But we must take this debate much further. We need to apply scrutiny to the way particular media institutions have covered recent social and political affairs. For example, we might question and expose the myth-mongering pushed by broad sections of the press on the question of immigration. We might also note the widespread, widespread problem the BBC now has in Scotland, where in recent years staff cuts and reduced resources have had a negative impact on the service that we need and want. Would change to the BBC Charter make it possible for responsibility to rest with Holyrood instead of Westminster? That, of course, should also be the subject of a debate. In many profound ways, we live in a media-managed democracy. We know the hold that a tiny minority of media owners can have over the outcome and framing of political events in the public mind. For so long, this has been impenetrable. But as Democrats, who have a view on the need for balanced and critical debate, perhaps now more than ever, we have a chance to challenge the vested interests and corporate power that lies behind sections of the mass media. Now more than ever, we have an electorate who have begun the process of grappling with this question. People are becoming shrewder about what information they digest, with many using the internet to do their own, more considered research into the issues of the day, domestic and international. Presiding officer, as elected representatives of the people, we have a particular responsibility to uphold when it comes to how our actions are covered. But more than that, we have a duty to ensure that coverage of the big debates, currently polarizing society, is not left to the media barons. It is time, is it not, for a new look at our media, a proper assessment 
of new media and a willingness to explore how we can support journalism as a trade and hugely important profession in Scotland. At a time when we see a resurgence in people sensing the power of their opinion and their vote, it is crucial that we express our desire to support those who can articulate and record their considered opinion for the benefit of increasing our knowledge and challenging how we think. This debate could not be happening at a more important moment in the development of our democracy and our society as a whole. Presiding officer, I think it's time for even bigger debate to happen in Scotland as to how we discover, as we discover more about our country, as we learn more about each other, as we learn more and more about the possibilities and raise uh, the, the ability for, for us to take uh, action and raise our game, I think that this debate is relevant today and I thank you for the uh, ability to be able to voice my concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Graham Day to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, President Officer, thank you. Can I begin by congratulating Jean Urquhart for bringing this matter to the Chamber and apologise to you and other members for not being able to remain for the entire debate owing to a meeting I am hosting shortly. Presiding Officer, there is a danger when you reach a certain age of viewing the past through rose-tinted spectacles, harking back to the good old days. So let me be clear, whilst the bulk of the 30 years I spent in my previous career were enjoyable, the last few were anything but. I left the field of journalism in November 2010, grateful to escape an industry already sailing into very difficult waters. And now, the best part of five years on, I do generally fear for where the print media is headed, both in terms of practices and viability, I have a good deal of sympathy for many of those who make their living in that field. In no particular order, let me expand on that, if I may. Beginning with highlighting an experience suffered by a constituent of mine, who had posted something on his personal Facebook page um, relating to the pain of losing his daughter some months earlier, being stoked again by the receipt of a piece of mail for her, and criticising the organisation, understandably so, which had sent it. The following morning, my constituent took a call from a journalist seeking a quote to include in a story that they were running on the situation. The man was horrified to learn that they'd sourced the planned article through a routine trawl of social media and had every intention of running with it, despite his making clear he'd received an apology, the matter was at an end, and he felt it would be utterly inappropriate for them to intrude on in what he concerned a private matter. He told me he had to spend the day negotiating with the paper to ensure his family weren't subjected to publicity they simply did not want. They remained shocked that a newspaper would stoop to trawling Facebook in this way and be resistant to rowing back once the family made clear their position. But, presiding officer, such are the demands being made on them, only the staff cutbacks. Journalists in some tit uh, titles routinely sit in offices sourcing copy directly from social media, including quotes. I highlight this example as an illustration of the kind of practices now being employed in parts of our media which would never have behaved like this before. Practices which the public are experiencing firsthand and balking at with the reputational consequences this has. But that said, let us also recognise absolutely the pressures that some journalists are having to contend with. Newspapers are trapped in a downward spiral that they seem incapable of escaping. As circulation falls, so they embark on cost-cutting and making further demands on demoralised staff, which in turn leads to diminishing quality of product, which in turn sees circulation collapse still further, and so it goes on. As a former journalist, I hear tales which genuinely sadden me. The newspaper, where the longest-serving reporter had been with him just 11 months. The young reporter handed a phone number by his editor for a Scot who had been caught up in the tragedy in Nepal, along with a list of questions, and who two questions into the interview had the phone put down on him, with the interviewee branding him an ambulance chaser. Such was the nature of the tack he'd been instructed to take. The phasing out of sub-editors with the implications that can have for quality control and presentation. The doing away with staff photographers, with picture duties given to reporters and freelancers who have to submit pics on spec and for a relative pittance. This is the reality for many journalists nowadays. Morale is rock bottom because of this. This, the erosion of terms and conditions of employment, and the wider cuts agenda. One respected weekly paper editor told me recently the financial restraints have become so bad that he had the public wandering into his office to check it was still open, as the refusal of the proprietors to meet the cost of window cleaning had left the premises looking like they were closed. Presiding officer, 
print media may well be headed online. We may only be a few years away from that happening. But I personally still hope there is and can be a future for newspapers. I believe that a thriving written press, which in a considered way, without fear or favour, holds those in authority to account, is vital in any democracy. And at a community level, I particularly hope we can somehow save the weekly paper sector, because at the risk of sounding old-fashioned, both are surely to be valued. Thank you. And thank you very much. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jamie McGregor. I congratulate Jean Ackert on bringing forward this important uh, motion. And if I can start with the least controversial bit of it, perhaps, I think we would all agree about the importance of local media. I'd like to pay tribute uh, today to the great work over many years uh, of the North Edinburgh News in my constituency and also Greener Leith. Regrettably, the former uh, lost its regular council funding uh, three or four years ago, and the mass distribution of hard copies of, of the newspaper that were possible as a result of that. But it's still a great source of news online, as is uh, Greener Leith. I should also point out that Greener Leith runs a social website, which is an interactive forum for raising awareness of local uh, concerns. So I think we all value uh, the local uh, media uh, that we have in our constituencies. Moving on, however, to a more controversial, the more controversial issue of media ownership, um, although perhaps it wasn't so controversial uh, three or four uh, years ago. Speaking in the House of Commons just days after the hacking scandal broke in 2011, David Cameron was explicit about the need for action. I quote, The challenge is how we address the vexed issue of media power. We need competition policy to be properly enforced. We need a sensible look at the relevance of plurality and cross-media ownership. Never again should we let a media group get too powerful. To address this problem, the Labour Party pledged in its manifesto for the recent election that, and I quote, no media company should have so much power that those who run it believe themselves above the rule of law. If uh, we had been elected last week, we as a party would have looked to adopt the proposals endorsed by campaigners limiting national newspaper ownership to 30% of the market. Such a law could have led to the breakup of News Corps in the UK which currently publishes 32% of the national daily newspapers and 34.5% of the Sunday market with its Sun Times and Sunday Times titles. <coughs> Presiding officer, many of the members um, in this chamber and indeed in Westminster will give testament to the enormous shift from the dominance of traditional media that we have seen over recent years. The ability of papers and broadcasters to steer the course of political dialogue is still a prevalent aspect of contemporary politics. But the use of social media to shape political debate and allow a more dynamic, instantaneous and reciprocal news source now offers the public the chance to become the creator of content with direct access to politicians. Carol Mill, research director of the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media, gave an account after the general election of the importance played by social media in the success and failure of campaigns. On the whole, he was largely positive about Twitter as a medium through which a more representative politics could be forged. Twitter is broadly representative of the UK, he said, now much more than in 2010. In 2010, about 34% of people in the UK were on social media, now well over half are. This is reflected in the sheer level of political content that passes through Twitter feeds every day. During the election campaign alone, there were an estimated 7 million tweets to any politician or candidate. As he points out, that's an enormous, chaotic morass of lots of things. What drives Twitter usage is converting likes and tweets and favourites into things that matter, volunteers, donations and ultimately votes. End of quote. It also offers a direct instantaneous source of news, often much faster than traditional media. And as many in the chamber will have witnessed, mediums like Twitter and Facebook have the ability to generate crowdsourced reaction to key political developments. As a result of this direct user-generated content, citizens feel more able to have direct contact, contact with MPs and MSPs, and this will undoubtedly have some impact in the long term on broader expectations of politicians. In conclusion, I welcome the debate today. It is a timely one and it poses many questions that are simply too complex to answer in one short debate. However, the mere fact that we are able to speak these words, broadcast them to the media, write them on our parliamentary website and tweet them to our followers shows that we have come very far since the days of the penny dreadfuls, the early yellow top gossip papers. Let's hope that this journey towards a more transparent, engaging system continues. I support the motion and congratulate Jean Urquhart on introducing it.
Thank you very much. And I now call on Jamie McGregor to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Jean Urquhart on securing today's debate, and there's much in Jean Urquhart's motion I can agree with, especially the belief that critical and well-supported journalism is essential to a thriving democracy. A strong media plays an important role in making politicians and government at all levels accountable, and that's how it should be. The motion notes the importance of the local media and press in my region of the Highlands and Islands, and I completely agree with this. The Highlands and Islands are fortunate to have a wide range of fantastic local newspapers, of which there are far too many to mention individually today. I would want to take this opportunity to commend the journalists and editors who work so hard to cover local news stories in my region. Many of these newspapers, as well as reporting on local stories and performing the important task of scrutinising the performance and decisions of local government in Scotland, can also help affect change by supporting local campaigns. Uh, I think, for example, of the recent and successful campaign to establish a new dialysis unit in Campbelltown Hospital, which was backed with great support by the Campbelltown Courier. Jean Urquhart is right to mention the development of news through the internet and social media, but she did mention TTIP, and on that issue I would agree. I um, received upwards of 500 e emails railing against TTIP and only one or two pro but it was quite obvious that the 500 were generated from one source. And while during the inquiry in, uh, the, uh, conducted by the European Committee into TTIP, the majority of the witnesses uh, were in favour of it. So I don't always think that social media uh, can be used... Uh, um, I'm, all right. Yeah. John Finney. Uh, thank you. I'm very grateful for the member taking intervention at that point. The vast majority, over 90 per cent, were corporate lobbyists. Do you think that these are reflective of the general public of the European Union? Before you respond, Mr Gregor, I don't want this debate to descend into a TTIP debate. This is about social media, please. <laughs> I'll take your advice on that and carry on um, in that case. Um, but anyway, as I say, many of our local newspapers have developed first-class websites, while in Argyll and Butte, the news website forargyle.com has developed a well-deserved reputation for its extensive and comprehensive coverage of all the key stories in the area and its insightful analysis. Linda Henderson and her team at Four Argyle work extremely hard and their success is reflected in the many thousands of page impressions they receive each and every day and the site's lively comments. Uh, Jean Urquhart has talked about trust in the media. All of us can agree that the events which led to the Leveson inquiry shocked many of our constituents. The UK government, however, I think, got the balance right in its response to Leveson in terms of seeking to preserve the freedom of the press while at the same time ensuring bad practice in journalism can be challenged. And I think we need now to monitor the effectiveness of the new independent, independent press standards organisation, IPSO, which replaced the Press Complaints Commission and assess its performance before considering any further changes in press regulation. And while Leveson saw focus on bad journalism, we should also recognise that the vast majority of journalists and others in the media work to very high standards. The BBC remains an institution which is respected worldwide, and we must cherish the expertise we have, for example, in the BBC World Service. Uh, the broadcast media's coverage of the recent general election was balanced and robust, despite the, the polls. And um, ITN and Channel 4 also offer some of the best international news coverage and analysis to be found, I think, anywhere in the world. So, um, to conclude, presiding officer, I welcome today's debate and agree that it's important we support a strong media in Scotland and the UK and have an ongoing and measured debate about how citizen society engage with our media and help ensure that it meets the expectations we have for fairness and for balance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call on John Finney, after which I uh, will move the closing speech to the Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. I too congratulate um, my colleague Jean Urquhart on bringing this motion to the Chamber. Uh, we know that uh, the media, and indeed from the contributions we have heard already, is a matter of great interest to the general public. It is perhaps unfortunate that it is not um, been a, receiving a bigger attendance in the Chamber here. Now, the motion talks about a, a widespread, deba uh, widespread debate. It talks about the relationship between the media 
political power and democracy. And people have talked about the different ranges in the media, from the locals, the nationals, the broadcast media, the social media and the internet. And the question of who has the power may be uh, important. Um, that was touched on uh, by Mr McGregor there. And, and I would venture that at UK level it still rests with a, a group of elites, the bankers, the public school boys, the military and the like. And of course, they're, they're lobbyists. And of course, people will always have concern about the term state broadcaster. Um, so we, we have to... Certainly. Mr McGregor. Um, I referred to witnesses we'd had at the European Committee. Uh, is he suggesting that all of these were public schoolboys? John Finney. Um, I don't know the committee you're talking about. I don't know... Uh, um, but um, I'm not suggesting that the exclusive witnesses you've received are public school boys, no. And not, nor was it a personal dig, so. Um, the um, promotion of news is terribly important, um, but also the reflection of opinion. And uh, I suppose we need to ask ourselves, what do we expect from the media? Do we expect, I think we want facts, we want opinion, we want analysis, we want a combination of all of these. But if we look, for instance, what are facts? Who says they are and based on what? Opinions clearly can't be right or wrong, but are they based on facts? Uh, and an analysis of facts and, and opinions will be very challenging for many people in the media for the very reasons we heard from Graham Day, and it was good to have that particular input from someone from the profession. So people would ask, are there agendas? Well, of course there are agendas. We all have agendas. Um, I'm very supportive of an organisation called Reporters Without Borders, and they want freedom of expression and of information and say that that will always be the most important freedom the world has. Uh, they go on to say, if journalists were not free to report the facts, denounce abuses and alert the public, how would we resist the problem of child soldiers defend women's right to preserve our environment? Now, at the moment, they are um, asking the UN Security Council to refer the situation they, their members find themselves in in Syria and Iraq um, to the International Criminal Court, and we know the situation with Al Jazeera uh, staff. Um, our our uh, media people do not find themselves in these circumstances, and I have to say, uh, uh, by and large, we know that, uh, that there's very good work done. People have mentioned communities, and of course it's not just community broadsheets, the local radios. I think the community empowerment has led to uh, radio stations as well. And we must sustain and indeed develop, um, as the motion says, these media outlets. Um, the national corporations, of course, follow a narrow agenda, and I'm not sure how we can deal with that, but there's much to commend um, outlets like Common Space, Bella Caledonia. Um, the motion also says uh, there's trust has been lost in a range of media institutions. Well, I think there's trust being lost in a lot of institutions, including politics. And I think we all must move to a situation where we move away from spinning stories to um, uh, providing facts and the basis for saying they are facts. So that would allow analysis, and that is a two-way engagement. So um, as has been rightly said, the Highlands and Islands is a very vibrant uh, paper section. Long may that uh, continue. That They view it as a public service ethos there must be a separation between our media and party politics. I think there's much to be positive out for the future. I applaud the work of the National Union of Journalists, encouraging young people into the profession. Uh, I commend their code of conduct and in the brief minutes of I say that first and foremost to say at all times journalists uphold and defend the principle of media freedom, the right of freedom of expression and the right of the public to be informed. And if we stick to these principles, I don't think we'll go far wrong. Thank you. And thank you. And we now move to the closing speech from the Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, I congratulate Jean Urquhart in securing uh, this debate and in local newspaper week. Can I say that life would not be the same without the weekly read of the Linlithgow Gazette? Uh, Presiding Officer, I, I welcome the chance to speak in this timely members' debate and for the interesting and informative comments we've heard. There is a widespread debate in Scotland about the relationship between the media, political power and democracy, and also a belief that critical and well-supported journalism is essential to uh, a thriving uh, democracy. That was a point just made by Jimmy uh, McGregor. For our part, uh, public engagement with politicians and the critical analysis presented of our work both inside and outside the chamber by the media is essential to building and maintaining uh, trust in the political process. It is also essential in terms of ensuring the continued participation of people throughout Scotland in shaping our nation's future. And Malcolm Chisholm uh, talked in his contribution about the role of social media uh, in elections particularly. 
A thriving um, media sector uh, which supports diverse job opportunities, training and development is important. And a press and media environment that values, respects and champions quality journalism is essential to our future. And in this regard, we should also note and recognise and appreciate the role of the new publication, uh, The National, in print. The levels of engagement seen both in September's referendum and during the UK general election campaign have been rightly celebrated and it is heartening that so many people feel they have a voice in the critical decisions which affect us all. However, despite such high levels of engagement, we find ourselves at a time of great change in how the media delivers its content and ensures a continued relevance amidst changing perceptions of what constitutes international, national and local. Nowadays, I can consume information from a variety of media outlets with news in many languages and from many perspectives at my fingertips. Such easy access to a plurality of information is a challenge to our traditional modes of consumption and engagement and can have an unsettling effect where what seemed to be established fact is quickly challenged by another point of view. I believe that this is very positive for the quality of debate, but it does change our relationship with the media and challenges our ability and appetite to distinguish between opinion and fact, something which may also impact on our levels of trust in media institutions, at least in the short term. To sustain a flourishing democracy in Scotland, we will need diverse and independent voices across the media. Yet media concentration is continuing and growing and a handful of corporations and individuals have considerable power over our news, cultural life and access to information. And that was a, a focus of John, fin uh, John Finney's uh, contribution. Decisions about the newspaper industry, such as merging titles, de-skilling and laying off good journalists are often made with scant regard for the impact such decisions will have on the ability of media to support democracy, political engagement and high quality debate in Scotland. We've seen uh, job cuts throughout the media sector, and including, of course, at the BBC. And on print journalism, Graham Day warned of the vicious cycle of deteriorating uh, circulation and standards uh, in the media. The move to online is also creating an ever more economically challenging environment for the print media. Recent figures for circulation in February show reductions in the last six months across major titles of between 5 and 15 per cent. And there has also been closures of a, a range of media organisations. But, of course, there are publications, though moving successfully, to online circulation that pays. Such challenging times for print journalism is leading to increased domination of the industry by a smaller number of large media organisations. And that's a challenge both for industry regulators and one of the reasons for the loss of trust in the media, which we have heard about in this debate today. Alternatively, uh, new media platforms have sprung up rapidly in the last few years. Access to local and social media provides many opportunities for voices to be heard in a range of issues. An example of that is indeed Gina Urquhart's own work on xenophobia earlier this year, which made excellent use of exactly these kind of opportunities. However, the ability of digital intermediaries, such as search engines and social media giants, to filter information threatens to create new monopolies and undermining these positive developments. And as the traditional print media adapts to respond to the digital age, it is critical that local voices are still heard and that high quality local journalism and media remains vibrant and continues to develop. And of course, the launch of local TV in Edinburgh and Glasgow earlier this year and forthcoming launches in Aberdeen, Air and Dundee are an interesting development here. The risks and opportunities at this point in time for the media in Scotland must be assessed and we must address the real issues facing us, particularly in those areas where trust has broken down in order to rebuild that relationship with people across Scotland. As the Chamber will know, the Smith Commission has made proposal for new powers for Scotland in relation to broadcasting, and this debate is well timed as we enter into that critical period. The continued work to implement proposals around uh, independent press self-regulation is also key to rebuilding trust in our media and helping to address structural issues. I'm committed to making sure we seize the opportunity and promote continued public debate to ensure that we can sustain and develop diverse media outlets which are able to generate positive engagement with politics, the parliament and the important issues facing society, ensuring that everyone has a voice in Scotland's future. I want to see a national debate with politicians, the industry and critically the public to ensure that we fully understand what is the vision for media in Scotland and where, which are the key issues we want to address from BBC Charter renewal to the support for independent producers across Scotland 
and supporting a vibrant and diverse print and online media. I look forward to a lively and informed dis discussion and debate on these issues with colleagues across the Chamber as we go for forward and throughout Scotland. Uh, this is a critical agenda. It is one that matters. And I'm uh, very pleased and grateful that Gina has brought this agenda to this Parliament. Thank you very much and thank you all very much. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30.